Hey, how's it going? I'm Chris Russell, and I'm about to do my talk on Target Acquired. And I bet you're wondering, why are you listening to me today? What is it that I have to say? Why am I a uh, SME on the subject? And the reason is, is um, I did human for 10 years. Um, between 2000, 2010, all I did every day was talk to people in multiple forms to gather information uh, based on objectives I was given. So for 10 years, my only job was to elicit information, exploit information, talk to people through interrogations, strategic debriefings, source operations, screenings, everything you can name it. So that's what I did. And over that time, I learned quite a bit. Um, interrogations and source operations are obviously quite interesting, um, but you learn a lot, about, a lot about humans during that period, about how people are motivated about what makes people tick about how you do listen information so what I want to do today is take that information and kind of relate it to infosec on a, a kind of insider threat kind of tangent so you have to bear with me this isn't the most natural progression but I think you'll see where I'm going with this and uh, we'll get to it so uh, so this is some of the contents that we're gonna go through you know who's who recon target and assess approach testing recruiting training operations Termination, detection, remediation summary, and a thank you at the end, of course. Um, so let's talk about in the realm of human operations, who the agents are. Who are the people that have an objective that are looking for assets to uh, recruit, to gather uh, information for them? So obviously there's nation states. Now nation states are obviously the most um, complex and have the most resources, but they're also the, the least likely to be targeting your organization. You know, your infosec for a small business, is China or Russia targeting you? Probably not. But in some cases they are. If you're a defense contractor, if you're working for the government, um, you have some sort of proprietary information, maybe even financial stuff, there's a chance you're in there. But again, least likely. Um, business competitors. Um, People don't feel like business competitors do that much competitive intelligence, but the fact is they do. They do hire ex-military and intel people to gather information on their competitors, to hire their competitors, to get proprietary information from the competitors, and bring over engineers and projects and download data and steal things and, and everything you can imagine. So it's not talked about a lot, but this definitely happens, and people need to be cognizant of that. Uh, ransomware gangs. So this is kind of a new one. People don't think ransomware gangs are in the human gang. They're not into recruiting people, they're not into talking to people who got information. But what they are doing is they're offering people large amounts of money to plant the malware because their phishing campaigns are failing. Um, and the reason why I bring this up is because I feel like this is a trend that's gonna grow. Ransomware obviously has been commoditized. They have a whole ecosystem. Um, this is something that is making good money. It's not gonna go away. And the fact that I'm seeing a lot of intel on them reaching out to people specifically developers and people with inside access to plant the malware and offering them close to half the ransom, uh, this isn't gonna go away. So we have to take this you know, as a real you know, consideration as far as them being into the kind of human realm. Criminal organizations have you know, for a long time been involved in human. You know, they're the people that are buying off the physical security, making people look the other way while they you know, steal this or that. Um, this is not a new tactic, not a new thing, but they're definitely on the chart. Activists and extremists are kind of in the same vein. Um, maybe you have an organization that's doing stuff that's you know, not quite on par, and there's some activists that want to get that information out or want to expose you. Um, they want to talk to employees that know of some things that you've been doing that aren't great. Um, these are all part of the insider threat kind of human track that I'm going to talk about. And lastly, extremists. An extremist is you know, a very broad term. Uh, in this context, I'm going to say it's you know, more about, I'll say, um, terrorist extremists that are maybe wanting to do harm to your organization by getting some sort of inside access and you know, taking down your, your, some, some sort of infrastructure organization as a terror tactic. Okay. Now, human used to be 100% face-to-face. Um, that's what I did. Face-to-face -face, you know, meetings, talking to people, you know, this ugly mug used to talk about people. Nowadays, this can be done remotely and that should be a little scary to people. You know, you used to have to be in a room, face to face, kind of charming people, winning them over, you know, 
winning hearts and minds, this can be very remote now based on just of the world we live in these days. So we have to take that in consideration too. It used to be very geographically isolating. Now, the fact that people can reach over via the internet, via various social media platforms, video chats, whenever, make connections on a different level than they could before, um, makes this capability a little bit different than it used to be. So now I've gone over the agents, let's talk about who some of these targets are for this kind of human insider threat you know, situation I'm talking about. Who are the targets? Developers, 100% number one target. They are the data holders. They are the application creators. They are the people that hold the keys, the secret keys. They're the people that are 100% being targeted. And that's one thing I want everyone to take away from this, is this, these are the people we need to protect. These are the people we need to look after. These are people in your organization that we need to stop treating like mercenaries and stop underpaying them because these, these individuals are doing everything for the applications in the organization. Uh, not necessarily being treated right and can easily, very easily be manipulated to do the wrong thing. Now, obviously executives, they've always, you know, have placement access to, you know, wide parts of organizations. So they're, you know, traditionally a high target. Information security, another high target because they can, you know, change things to change access. They can delete audit logs and do a lot of things. Physical security. Another thing where people can, again, look the other way, guards can open up a gate, leave a door open. Uh, you know, they're, you know, traditionally a pretty big target. System administrators just, you know, based on their, their access, they can create access. And then finance, obviously, anyone who's close to the money can help other people who want to get close to the money get close to the money. So, big takeaway there, developers are the number one target here. We need to watch out for them. So, recon. This is the first phase in the human cycle of targeting and assessing someone. So in the recon phase, we're looking for who has placement access to our objective. So whether you're a nation state, you're some sort of business that wants competitive intelligence, whatever it is, you have an objective and you want to say, okay, who has placement access to this information? Who has placement access to this prototype, to the, the scientist who's the lead scientist? This is what placement access is. And during this phase, they spend a lot of time figuring out all the people that have legitimate placement access to what they want. Again, this can be data, this can be prototypes, this can be systems, personnel, it can be many different things. But the point is, they wanna know who has proximity and access to it on a regular basis. And then based on that, they're gonna create a list. And that list is gonna be prioritized based on who has the best access. They're going to take their time. They're going to look at these people very closely. They're going to research them. You know, all the things that, you know, we know goes on with intelligence collection. Um, they're going to go through this whole process and they're going to come up with a primary person who is their lead person to target and assess. This is the person with the best placement access to whatever objective they have. So again, whether it's a database, prototype, whatever it is, they're going to find the one person who's most likely to be able to get whatever they want and they're gonna put them number one on their radar. And after that, they're gonna target and assess them. Now targeting and assessing them means they're going to look at their life very deeply. They're gonna look at their profile. They're gonna look at their lifestyle, how they live their life, what they do, their social media content. What do they do on weekends? How they spend their money? What are their hobbies? What's their love life like? What's their debt like? This is the reason why when people get security clearances, the government consistently goes through all these things because they're looking for weaknesses and chinks in the armor that these you know, other uh, agents want to exploit. But when you're targeting assessing someone, you're figuring out everything about this person that makes them in some way available to you for some form of manipulation. So to target rich environment, they're gonna look for disgruntled workers individuals with high debts, loners, idealists, the disenfranchised. Now, it used to be this had to be a very, again, human thing. They had to be, have boots on the ground. They had to be near the business. They had to be near the people to find out, you know, at bars, at, you know, group meetups, at social, you know, situations, who these people were. But with social media and online activities, you can identify these people pretty easily now. So we got to keep that in mind that we, you know, even with the best OPSEC, people are putting themselves out there on, on kind of what their life situation is. And these are things that are being used to, you know, identify these people. So 
Um, once we identify this group of people that have placement access and we've identified what their motivations are, we're going to determine who's the most likely, who's the best candidate to uh, be recruited for process of, of, of doing some sort of objective for them. So the next step is an approach. Now, again, we've identified someone with placement and access who has some sort of weakness, they have some sort of vulnerability, they have some sort of chink in their armor that gives us an opening, and we're gonna design the perfect approach that is gonna blow this person's mind. This is, we're gonna find the thing this person's been looking for their entire life. Is it their love life? Is it uh, a hobby? Is it a business deal? Whatever it is, we're gonna find what that is and we're gonna use that to create an opening into their life in a way that's so meaningful that they're going to want us in their life. Um, I'm being very emphatic about this because this is a very powerful thing for people who've been missing something in their life and we're gonna offer that. And we offer that knowing they're gonna jump at it because that's human nature. So our approach is gonna be you know, answering things like love problems, money problems, you know, some people want to be part of something. Some people want to be something. Some people want to own things. Some people want to be part of history, to be famous, to be a, you know, a change agent. They want something that, that means something to them. And the, the agents we talked about earlier, they're going to find out what this motivation is. You know, people have typically tangible and intangible motivations. Some people are very much motivated by just cash, what they can buy, what they can own. But some people want to be something. They want to be, you know, like I said before, famous, but some people want to be pious. Some people want to be a helper. Some people will be known as someone who did the right thing whenever they're asked. They want to be part of something known in history as a good act. These are major motivations in people's lives. And when you tap into these things, you can make people do things that, you know, typically would be against their nature. As I said before, for 10 years, what I did was I got people to do things that were not in their best interest. That was the reality. I had to talk to people and say, you know what? Normally, it would be not a good idea for you to betray all of your countrymen and give me this information. But we have this thing between you and me that we've established that is important to you. And it's more important than anything else. And that's why we're going to do this. And I'm, I'm really dumbing that down, but it's a very powerful thing because everyone's searching for something in their life. And when someone comes along and answers that, people put their blinders on and they accept it. You know, people joke about, you know, someone, you know, some guy wins a million dollars, all of a sudden he has a, a beautiful wife. Um, and he knows why he has a beautiful wife because he's a million dollars, but he kind of lies to himself a little bit, doesn't he? That it's the million dollars, it's not him. Um, everyone does that. Um, that's the reality. If you have the opportunity to live out the dream you've been waiting for your entire life, um, you don't necessarily stop and ask questions. So let's say you want to be known in the gaming industry as someone who is part of some great um, group of gamers or whatever, and this group you know, brings you up and says, you're gonna be our, our paladin, you're gonna do whatever. Um, if that's been your goal in life, you're not gonna really ask questions why they picked me. You know, maybe you do, but as soon as they're like, no, you're our guy, you're the badass, you, your scores are great. You don't step back and think about there's some ulterior motives. You're just like, this is what I've been waiting for, you know? Now I use that as a kind of a silly example because it's online, but this is the method in which people are being approached these days. It's not as much in person. It's not in bars. It's not in, you know, you know, gyms. It's online. So, you know, forums, gaming, um, dating, these are places where people who have been looking for something are being given something they've been looking for and they're in a susceptible state so they don't necessarily ask that many questions. So again, we're looking for people that are looking for the perfect match, the perfect friend, the perfect offer, whatever it is. And when they get offered that, they don't ask a lot of questions. So now um, the agents approach someone. They've offered them this thing that they love, whether it's the friendship, it's the camaraderie, love, um, whatever it is, um, and they have this bond and they're hanging out. Well, the agent still needs to know this person is capable of doing the objective, getting the thing they want at the end of the day. So they test them and they test them a bunch of different ways because, you know, they're putting a lot of resources into this. They don't want this to fail. They don't want someone who just has good intentions 
to screw something up. So they test them with things like, let's see what I can get them to do early on. Let's make sure they're the right guy. Even though we have a good approach, they've got place and access, let's make sure they're really the guy for the objective, for the, the operation. So we're gonna test them. We're gonna give them easy tasks to start. Hey, um, and it's not necessarily tasks that are like, hey, go tell us, you know, you know, who's on your payroll at your company, something like that. These are simple things like, hey, send me a picture of you because you're online, not really like, you know, you don't really show your picture, but let me show you a picture of you. And it's, it's making them show that they trust you. So that's one of the first things, you know, you, you test them there. Then you test them with like, oh, hey, we're friends and we're doing this thing and we're, you know, we're part of this group and hey, can you find this information for me? And you, and you ask them something you already know. So when they come back to you with the right information, you go, okay, great. And you know, you can trust them a little bit because they came back with the right information. Then you trust them with, then you ask them something that doesn't exist. You say, hey, again, we're friends, we're buddies, we're lovers, whatever it is. Can you go find this? And it doesn't exist. And if they come back with an answer, you know, they don't have the heart to tell you they failed. And that's also kind of important. What they should do is come back and say, you know what? That doesn't exist. I looked forever. That doesn't exist. This information doesn't exist. Whatever it is you asked for doesn't exist. But what happens in Intel and in this whole situation is that in this relationship where someone's come into their life and offered them something they love and they've been looking for, if the thought of failing them is not great. So they'll come up with information or come up with things that don't exist. And that's not good either. So that's part of the testing process. Um, we're gonna test limitations, we're gonna test weaknesses, we're gonna find out how this guy or girl works, what they can and can't do, what they can handle. Are they technical proficient? Are they not technically proficient? Are they good under pressure? Are they not good under pressure? We're gonna test all these things. Because again, we have this whole plan for them to get us some information or access to something. We don't want to fail at the last minute. So we're gonna go through all these tests. And then once they've passed these tests and they are suitable, we're gonna recruit them. Now, we talked earlier about, hey, we got them on our team, we did this approach, they really liked us for whatever reasons, but recruitment's different. Up until now, they've been an unwitting source. Up until now, they thought this was just some, hey, we're friends, we're you know, maybe you know, you know, romantically interested, we're colleagues, we're business partners. They've been unwitting until now. Now's the time where the mask comes off and we say, no, you know what? We were friends, we talked to you because you're awesome, we did this or this and this and this, but the reality is, is we have a real mission for you. It turns out we're really this, we're competitor, we're nation state, we're activists. We take our masks off, we say, this is who we really are, but we think you're still gonna like us because we still are doing the thing that you want. We still have aligned with this passion that you've been looking for. And so the, the, the recruitment is getting to go from unwitting to a witting source where they're gonna now knowing that they're working for someone, that they're, they're dealing with someone who has an agenda that they're still gonna do it. Now at this point, some people do, some people don't, you know, it's not necessarily exact science on, on, on how likely someone is. But let's say someone says, hey, you know what? We were like great friends, uh, we were love interests, we were great business partners, but now you say that you're actually a Chinese, you know, intelligence agency, I'm out. Well, that's when the gloves comes off and the Chinese intel agency says, well, that's great, but you know, we dug up all this dirt on you and you actually did this, this, and this. So if you don't do that, we're gonna expose that. Or we've been recording everything you've been doing with us. And if you don't do this, we're gonna do this operation anyway. And we're just gonna blame it on you. And we have all this contact. We have all the paperwork. We'll just pin it on you anyway. So you might as well go along with this. It's not the best way to get into a human operation, but sometimes that happens. You know, the blackmail part, not great, we wanna go with the, you know, the honey part, but sometimes you gotta go with the stick. But let's say they're still on board. They say, you know what, you're right. Um, it's a little bit weird, turns out that you're a competitor, you're a nation state, you're an extremist, you're an activist, whatever it is, but I really connected with your message. I really believe that we have this bond. We are really buddies, lovers, whatever it is. Now the agent's gonna train them because they need, again, they need to perform this objective. They need to, to get the job done. So we tested them before. Now we're actually gonna train them. So we're gonna say, okay, this is the things you're gonna do to get ready for this objective. We're gonna plan. We're gonna plan what day it is, the time of day it is, the best possible situations for the outcome to be beneficial to all of us. We're gonna help you plan all that. 
and we're going to make it, we're going to go over it so many times that it's going to be in your head. You don't need to write it down. There doesn't need to be any paper trail. There doesn't need to be a diagram of this. We're going to go over it so many times that in muscle memory, it's in your head. We're going to go over a communication plan. This is how you get a hold of us. This is how we talk. This is how we pass messages to different parts of this group. Um, that again, doesn't need to be written down, doesn't necessarily need to be in a cell phone. We're gonna have them remember numbers, remember codes, all these things. Communication plan is very important because in the middle of operation, you don't want very obvious things like, I'm about to go steal the secrets now. We don't want that in a text. We don't want that in an email. That's just a paper trail. We want it very smooth, very natural. Um, everyone assumes that you know they'd be a really good agent, but the reality is most people are not a very good spy. Most people are very bad at it. They're like, oh, I'm in, the sp I'm in the room, I'm in, what do you want? I can get all the things and like, shh, don't email that, don't text that, just get the stuff and get out. So that's part of the communication plan. Then there's the operational plan, what they're gonna actually do, what they're infiltrating, what they're stealing, what they're placing, whatever it is. There's gonna be a whole process where we go through ad nauseum how they go through step by step everything they need to do to not just do it, but do it in a way where it's not necessarily traceable. So they clean up after themselves, so they don't leave evidence, so they don't leave things that can come back to haunt them or the origin, origin, uh, originating agent. We have a backup plan. So if one door is locked, one system's down, okay, this is what we're gonna pivot to because we picked a day, we picked a time, we have a whole operation, we don't want it to fail last minute just because some random maintenance thing happened. We're always gonna have a backup plan and we're gonna train them on that. So they naturally pivot to it, don't freak out. Because the average person, when they go to open the door that's supposed to be open and it's locked, freaks out. And then they're gonna start dancing, looking around, they're gonna make faces of the camera, and that's not gonna be cool. So we're gonna go over the backup plan so smoothly that they just naturally transition to it. They don't raise any more red flags. And then let's say everything goes smoothly, um, we're gonna go over the blowback plan so that let's say they do this operation, everything's fine, but then they're gonna get questioned afterwards most likely because they do have placement access. We're gonna go over how they beat this test, how they have a cover story, how we park their car 10 miles away at a bar during this time so it looks like there's someone else. We're gonna go over this at nauseum so if someone just does a rudimentary check, they have the good answers, they're not going to be like, oh, it turns out I was working for spies. I'm sorry. Uh, we don't want them to do that. So we're going to go over the bull black plan so, you know, so well that it's a second nature to them. They don't feel like they're lying. Then we're going to do the operation, which ultimately is the most anticlimactic part. Everyone assumes the FBI is waiting, the CIA is waiting. They have to break into Fort Knox. The reality is no one's waiting. There's very little resistance. They get to do what they want to do and they leave and no one even notices. Um, the deed is done. They dropped the malware. They stole the information. They took the prototype. They deleted vital systems. They placed a black door, a rat, or a key log, or whatever it is. And they think, wow, that was pretty easy. Again, they're waiting for the National Guard to be waiting outside when they came out. But the chances are, no one's really watching. No one's really paying attention. No one really cares. Because there's so many things going on that one little guy stealing one little bit of information just isn't on anyone's radar. Um, but because we've made such a big deal about this, they're just assuming it's going to be that bad, but it's really not. So the operation typically is the easiest part of all this, the training, the approach, everything leading up to this. That's the hard part. The operation is like pretty simple, but we don't want it to go wrong. So we spend all that time making sure it's right. And then later we're going to ask, why was it so easy? And that's part of my remediations later on. Okay. Termination. So termination sounds bad, but no one dies, you know, usually. Um, termination is where the op's over and we want our asset to still like us, to still believe in our, our kind of message, to believe in what we got together to do so that when asked, they don't immediately just rat us out. We want them to think that they did the right thing, that they are on the right team, that they didn't make a mistake, that they didn't betray everyone they love. Um, we want them to still feel like that this is still may happen. We want to extract ourselves because the agent has, doesn't want anything to do with this asset anymore, but we don't want them to feel like that. So it's, you know, it's not you, it's me. I got to go do this other thing, but we'll be back and we'll do more of these cool things and we'll do all this stuff that you were excited about. So we keep them all riled up so that the asset still believes the story. They don't think it's over. They, they don't feel like they were used. They, they're actually going to miss their agent. They're going to miss that connection, that thing they had that got them roped in originally. Um, when you read some of the, um, some of the um, uh, 
some of the history of, of, of spies and, and, and tradecraft, you'll find that often people who have been caught still actually believe they were doing the right thing because the, the whole process was so, so good that they actually bought into whatever agenda it was and they felt like they were on the right side. And even after they were in jail for a while, they felt like they were, had been doing the right thing the whole time. So that's not uncommon. So after termination, let's talk a little bit about um, what could have been done from the blue team side to maybe stop all this? Because we just went through this whole process of how someone was recruited, approached, target assessed, they did the operation. This is all stuff that happened outside of a company's network. This happened outside of anything that's logged. This happened mostly outside of anything that you have any purview of. So what are defenders going to do to protect their company against this sort of activity? It's very hard, isn't it? Um, but there are some things we can do, and that's what I'm going to get into right now. So let's talk about defenders. Let's talk about detections. So, you know, obviously in Intel, or I'm sorry, in uh, information security, it's all about detections, about your die loss protection, your endpoint detection response, your intrusion detection systems, your user behavior analytics, uh, removable media, you know, policies, your dark web monitoring. These are all things that people talk about. Your insider threat program are ways you can detect people doing these things, stealing this information, accessing this information, getting into things they're not supposed to. The problem is, is that this is a very wide area and a lot of people might have access to this. So it's very hard to write detections that are, that are actually really good at detecting someone who normally should have access to this because we established they have placement access to this, that they're really doing something abnormal. So, well, it's good to have all these things. It's good to have an insider threat program. It's good to have DLP, EDR, IDS, UBA, Ruble Media, and Dark Web. It's not going to necessarily solve all the problems. Um, this is what the vendors are going to tell you to buy. This is what you're going to see in most of the announcements on this is how you deal with insider threat. You deal with a SIM. You deal with the UBA. UBA is the number one thing people talk about. You know, All of a sudden, they're logging in at weird times. Well, they don't always log in at weird times when they're stealing information because their handler is going to say, don't log in at a weird time. That's going to set off a trigger. Not log in in your normal business hours. That's the first thing I would tell someone. Don't do something weird. Don't do something abnormal. That's the first thing that's going to get you picked up. So these things are great from a, like you got to have them in place, but these aren't really the solutions for how you solve this whole dilemma of how human and insider threat interact. What we have to do is some things that are a little bit more basic. What we have to do are the remediations. So what we have to do is create an environment where people don't feel like they can get away with doing any of this without really there being any repercussions. So how many of you have been in an environment where everyone had admin rights? We've all been there, right? Everyone had access to everything. You know, startups this happen, some even enterprise organizations happen. This is a problem. There shouldn't be a situation where people can feel like they can access anything they want at any time, and there's really gonna be no questions asked. Um, that's an environment where people who are recruited to do these things think, okay, um, I really bought into all these things this agent told me. I really believe in the story. I really believe in this agenda they told me. And I'm not going to get caught if I do this. So this is a win-win for me. What we need to create is a, a, a shadow of doubt for them. So they go, you know what? I really believe in what you're saying, Mr. Agent Man. Um, I really want to be part of this thing you said. I really want to be an agent of change. But if I log into this and I start pulling this information, that's like immediately going to be detected. That's immediately going to be something that's noticed or I don't even have that access on a normal basis without a little bit of scrutiny. That's the situation we want. And the way we do that is, you know, the basics, least privilege. You know, we don't have everyone having access to everything. So that limits the amount of people originally on that list in the very beginning of people with placement access. We want to make this harder for the bad guys. If everyone has placement access, they've got the full gambit of people with weaknesses to exploit. We don't want that. We want them to have to work for it and find one or two people that have actual access to that sensitive information in a way where they could gather it. So we wanna have least privilege employed. Um, immutable, infra immutable infrastructure. Now this is not something that everyone, every organization can, can you know, roll out. But if you can, think about this. We want as, as few humans interacting with servers as possible on a manual basis because that's, in, that's the situations where data is 
is pulled or things are dropped or keyloggers or malware, whatever it is. If humans can go and touch a server whenever they want and there's really no one asking questions, they can do whatever they want. That's not a good situation. What we want is automation to be taken care of this, where someone, if they want to update a server, it happens via automation. It makes it much trickier. This is a whole CI CD pipeline. There's roadblocks, there's approvals, there's all these things where, hey, Joe just can't SSH to a box and start pulling information without a bunch of people asking information. And you do that with immutable infrastructure. Again, not every organization can pull that off, but if you can, it makes it so much easier to notice when, hey, you know what? Uh, So-and-so just you know, SSH into you know, the jump box and went to here. That's not normal because we don't do things that way. We don't necessarily go in and do surgery. We just kill the host and let the auto scaling group bring it back up. The more you can move to that, it makes it much easier to detect when people are, are doing things that are you know, unsanctioned. We want to have two-person integrity for pretty much everything we can do. Now, this is, again, this isn't a product. This is a process. You know, there shouldn't be anyone that can do anything in your environment and know there's no questions asked. You know, you could be the, the VP of infrastructure. You shouldn't be able to go in and do anything without someone being saying, hey, what, what, what are you actually doing here? You know, there's no change window for this. You don't have, there's no reason for you to be touching this. These alerts should be going off. There should be someone who, who's alerted to this that's either equal or, or, or even higher uh, seniority. They can say, you know what? I don't understand why, what you were doing messing with all this stuff like during off hours or during you know, early morning or even at all because it's really not your job. Two person integrity, again, not a product, it's a process, but we need to in incorporate that more so that people don't feel like they can just go and do anything and there'd be no repercussions. Another important thing is training. So again, um, we live in a world right now where applications are pretty much, you know, most organizations lifeblood, almost everything is an app now. Every service you can think of is an app. So the developers that work on those are, are again, the number one targets for anyone who wants to get data from them or, or, or mess with them or cause problems for them. We need to talk to these people like, hey, you just took a job for a FinTech company and you're part of an important you know, financial thing that you're developing, someone may come to you at some point and start talking to you about your job or make friends with you and it seems a little bit weird. You know, we need to train these people to, see, to say that you may be a target for this thing. Now, it's, again, it's very unlikely a nation state is targeting your people, but how many times do recruiters come and steal your people and they take them to a different company? And maybe they take some of the stuff they're working on with them. That's not abnormal. That's a lesser version of what I'm talking about. And we need to protect ourselves from that too. So we need to train our people to be like, hey, you know what? You know, you're in a sentence position. You have access to all these things. Someone may start talking to you randomly about these things. And if that happens, you know, you, you gotta be sensitive to that and kind of pick up on that and, and kind of, you know, make sure you don't have blinders on that, you know, that it's, that's, that it's not a natural situation. Another thing we do is code analysis. You know, we gotta scan our codes. We gotta find vulnerabilities early, but also unsanctioned, you know, parts of our code. We talk about solar winds. Um, Solar winds, the supply chain exploit, you know, they got in and they added snippets for, to add backdoors to their, to their code. Um, now they were doing some code analysis, but clearly not enough to pick up that there was changes to the hash to the environment um, that they had, you know, that had been altered. So, you know, if we start incorporating that, start letting people know, hey, yeah, you're a developer, but you can't just write a backdoor into this, you know, let's say you're working crypto and you want to, you know, like office space, steal just a couple, you know, F of gas per transaction to go back to some wallet. That should be scanned and that should go through, you know, peer review so that people don't think they can get away with those things. It's not that it's necessarily going to catch it, but if it's in place, people are just not going to try it. And that's really the main point. Another thing people need is a means of reporting when this stuff happens. So let's say my situation I explained earlier, where someone was approached, they were recruited, and then they decided, oh crap, this isn't what I thought it was. If they don't feel like they can go to talk to some of the organization without getting in trouble, they may say, crap, I gotta do, I have to like go through this because now I'm, you know, I have no means, I don't even know who I'm supposed to talk to. If they know, hey, this is who I'm supposed to go talk to, I'm supposed to go talk to the CISO, I'm also supposed to go talk to compliance, whoever it is, set some designation up where, hey, you work in a sensitive part of the company and someone approaches you to gather information, they should know exactly who they should talk to so it's a no-brainer and they feel relaxed about it and they know they're not in trouble. Because a lot of people will feel like, oh, I don't want to like cause stress in my life, I don't want to cause friction, I don't want to like invite this, this issue, so I'm just going to not say anything about it. But then they can get dug deeper into a bad situation. They should know that, hey, 
um, yeah, I was, uh, I was at a bar and, you know, this guy was talking to me and he was asking a lot of stuff about the business and what, what not. They should have a means of reporting that to get it off their chest and to, and to you know, and, and get some, and some feedback so they know what to do next if that person comes back. Now, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the summary of all this. So, we talked about the adversaries and what they're going for. They're going to go for placement access. They're looking for to find motivation. They're going to manipulate your desires. They're going to prep the asset. They're going to deploy the asset. And they're going to leave the asset thinking they did the right thing. And what are the defenders going to do? They're going to restrict access. They're going to create consequences for the asset. They're going to create barriers for the asset. They're going to trust but verify. They're going to log the asset's actions and the right detections. And they're trained to talk people about the situation. Now, again, yeah, this is a very um, this is a very broad spectrum of, of of human from nation state to you know just a business competitor where, um, you know, business competitors aren't going to have the same resources, but these concepts are all pretty much the same. They're all kind of going after the same things. So we want to have the same things in place. We want to maybe assume the worst, maybe assume it's, you know, nation state level, um, and, and their capabilities, but put those things in place. So this is not an environment where someone feels like if they're approached and things are going well, that, yeah, I could probably get away with that. And it's not going to cause me my job. Probably not going to be a blowback. Probably people can't really find what it is I did. It's really a key, um, more so than detections, to really hamper down on, the, on this kind of threat. Now, in the beginning, I talked a little bit about um, you know, who the agents were and who the targets were. And I want to kind of rehash that a little bit because I feel like that's a really important part. Now, developers, as I said, they are the gatekeepers of data right now. They are the gatekeepers of your applications. And everything is an application right now. So they're the number one target. And if we're treating them like mercenaries and we're not paying them well and we're not vetting them well, how well can we really depend on them to, to really be loyal to us? We really can't. And we really need to change that too. So that's another piece I didn't really add in here. But we really need to change our behavior about how we're treating developers and people who, who, who help us um, launch our, our, our applications in a way where we feel like we're, we're not giving them the keys of the kingdom without getting them some stake in the game. Because if there's no stake in the game, they don't care if we fail. They don't care if they give a, their intel to a competitor. They'll go to a competitor and bring everything they worked on with them. We got to change that dynamic because that's, again, a lesser part of human. But how many times have you seen uh, a you know, selfless driving car company has to sue another selfless drive driving car company because their lead engineer left and he happened to have all of his data on his own laptop. Well, why did that situation even happen in the first place, really? You know, why was it on his personal laptop? Why is he the one guy with all the data? How was he able to get approached and kind of pulled away so quickly? Why wasn't the company who employed him like treating him if he's the lead guy for their main project and that's their main business line? Why were they so removed that they didn't even see this happening? Again, it's a very hard thing to do from an InfoSec standpoint, but we have to start thinking about these terms because this is going to become a very big part of, of our, our issues going forward. Again, because everyone can start touching us remotely unlike before. So China, Russia, we're, you know, we're dealing with, with phishing attempts and we're dealing with all these other things. We're going to start seeing human and targeted recruitment of our own employees in an insider threat vector if we don't start you know, preparing our people for that. Um, deep fakes. How many times have we started seeing where deep fakes have confused people and the, we're, we're, you, know, s you know, social engineering is what we're calling it right now, but deep fakes can be much more than social engineering. Once we start getting into recruiting people and, uh, and convincing people that they're you know, working for the right people, we're going from like you know, witting, you know, unwitting to witting sources is what I'm talking about. The, the witting sources who are willing to do something. These are, this is all an evolving thing that we're really on the cusp of right now. And technology is really, um, really exacerbating how bad it can get. So, you know, before the pandemic where, you know, life wasn't as remote, this wasn't as much of an issue. But because everyone's remote now, we have so many remote capabilities. The ability for the agents to reach out and touch our people has expanded astronomically um, along with our ability to work remotely. 
So we have to think in these terms and consider these terms and, and look at our employees as, you know, not necessarily liabilities, but susceptible to these things. You know, they're online all the time now. The last two years, what did it have anyone else to do after work when we're all locked down? They're online. Well, what do you think they're doing online? They're talking to people. They're, they're meeting people. They're doing whatever it is. This created a perfect storm for this sort of thing to become normal. And I guarantee you, and I know for a fact because of this intel I've been involved in, this is happening. You know, nation states, business competitors, you name it, they're using this opportunity to get to people they couldn't get to before. They're talking to people that were unreachable before. And it's only going to get worse. This is something we have to take into consideration as one of our future threat vectors. It's one of the things we have to threat model against. It's not just phishing. This is a much more advanced version where they're going to convince people to go in and get stuff for them. They're not just going to trick them. They're going to convince them it's what they should do. We talk about, or I shouldn't say we talk about, but you know, as many of you may know, people can uh, perform physical pen tests where someone comes in and they try and get into your environment and steal stuff or plant stuff or get access to something. That's great, that's a great test. But the reality is, is why would someone do that if they can just recruit someone to do it for them that it's already in the office? That's the real threat. That's what's really gonna happen. It's already been happening quite a bit. It's underreported because it's almost never caught. But that's the real situation we're dealing with now where why would someone go in and risk getting arrested? Why would a nation state or a criminal organization or a ransomware game try and go in and plant a USB or steal data or whatever they do. Why would they do that if they could just recruit someone who takes all the blame if they're caught, but already has placement access? It's much easier. It's, it's, it's a no brainer. And if we're not thinking like that's a possibility, we're not thinking clearly. This is very much a possibility. It's happening now, again, because it's, it's just kind of, you know, we used to think of the old days of, of human being like the Cold War, Russia, China, US, you know, honeypots and, dead drops and all these things. That's not the world we live in anymore. We're engaged online 24 seven. People meet people and fall in love with people and make best friends online now. And if you don't think that someone can get online and make a connection and convince someone to do something against their best interests, then apparently you've been online lately because I see it happening every day. I see stuff on every social media platform you can think of where people are constantly influenced easily to change their opinions, to conform to something, to be excited about being part of a group. And that's with very little effort. Imagine if someone's trying to do it. If their goal is to recruit someone, how easy it is. And especially with all this information available, again, back in the day, human, you had to do all this you know, intel research where you had these dossiers where people had collected information manually through a bunch of old tactics. Well, now it's just online. You can look at someone's song playlist and know what they're feeling pretty much in the minute. Oh, you're playing a bunch of uh, Guns N' Roses. You're rocking out to the 80s. I got a little bit of idea about who you are. Um, oh, you're listening to X music. Well, probably having a bad day, bro. Um, maybe you need a shoulder cry on. Maybe you need a hug. Maybe you need more than that. Not that hard, is it? You know, um, you combine that with photos and everything else people are sharing. It's very easy. Now, um, now you guys will probably, you know, anyway, watching the video, maybe look me up on Twitter or whatever it is and say, okay, you share information, Chris, and you're talking about human, you're talking about how easy this is. Why do you share anything? Well, the reality is, is that for years I didn't. Again, 10 years, this was my life. And for 10 years, I did nothing online. I literally had no photos and no nothing and no presence. And I decided, you know what? I'm done with that. I, haven't, I, I want to be out there. I want to be part of this this thing we're doing. I don't have a problem with it because I know what I can face and I know if someone's going to come at me that it's a honey pot or some kind of scam or whatever it is, I'm not as concerned about it. It also, you know, doesn't hurt that I also found out that all of my information was breached by the OPM. So literally both China and Russia have not just my DNA, all my financial records, my psych records, all the stuff they did to investigate me when I got my TSSCI. So if they wanted to know anything about me, they already have all that. So there's really, really little they're gonna get from social media that they don't already have. Um, most people are in that situation, but that's mine personally. So I'm not saying all this stuff about social media to scare anyone. Share your photos, share your life, not a big deal. But just remember, if all of a sudden you're having a bad day, 
and someone pops up and they're the answer to all your problems, ask a question, is this natural? Is this normal? Why are they talking to me, you know? Why all of a sudden, when I've been searching for my whole life for this one thing, is it popping up right at the moment my lowest? Maybe it's a natural thing, maybe it's not, but you should ask the question. You shouldn't just be like, oh, thank God, finally. Finally, the woman of my dreams, after 45 years of being single, has found me. Is it possible? Yes. Is it reality? Probably not. So, anyway. I'm going to say thank you right there. I hope I made this interesting. Again, uh, human uh, tradecraft, how this relates to InfoSec and the kind of guarding your, your infrastructure is a little bit of a leap for some people. They don't necessarily, you know, I was kind of stressed like my concerns about this. Um, I know n not many people are necessarily buying into that yet, but I feel like with the trends that we'll start seeing, this is gonna be a very real thing. I really do believe in this. And that's why I gave this talk, because I want us to get ahead of this. I feel like as a community, we got to think about these things before they're a problem. Um, we're on the cusp of that right now. So I hope people listen to this, digest it, use it where it's applicable. Um, not all of it is yet. Again, not every, everyone's getting approached by a nation state and recruited for you know, Chinese and Russian espionage. Um, but the techniques are there and it's very real. And as you know, with social media and online, online platforms, it's very easy for people to get you know, manipulated on a daily basis without much effort. So just imagine if someone wanted to do it. So take that in mind, help protect your organization, protect yourself and uh, have a good day. Thanks.